I'm Ankit, and this is joint work with my advisor, Brighton Godfrey, and uh, Alexandra Kola at UIUC. This is a road network map from Rome about five, about fifth century, and uh, all roads lead to Rome here. The point of this is just to illustrate that network design has been around a while. It's not new. It, all roads lead to Rome, but at some point, this process did become intentional and even competitive. This here is a pigeon carrier pigeon network map from several European nations. What's missing here is Great Britain, and of course, an English journal is complaining. How long must we wait until our pigeon system rivals those of the continental powers? Now, I'll, fa I'll not give you a history lesson. I'll fast forward through railroad networks, telegraph, and uh, supercomputing to arrive at data centers where network design is faced with new opportunities and new challenges, right? New opportunities in that these are large networks that are usually controlled by just one entity. You don't have to deal with geographic constraints like the railroad networks, and you don't have pigeon whimsy that impacts your throughput. Challenges, well, this one plot sums it up neatly. This is data from Facebook published in Wired magazine. It shows, it shows uh, the growth of Facebook's network traffic over the course of roughly a year uh, the point of interest here is the orange line, which is traffic internal to Facebook's data center. So traffic internal, internal traffic is growing at a very rapid pace, which is what underscores the need for throughput in data centers, that being our subject, or subject of interest here. In response, several topology options have been proposed, and the number keeps growing at every conference. We are contributing one here. Uh, <laughs> So we have toruses, hypercubes, and fat trees here. The point here is that we have a large number of options, but we don't even have a good ordering on this set of options. We don't even know what network is better than the other under various circumstances. We don't have a good understanding of this big question. Sorry, big question, I said. How do we design throughput optimal network topologies? Right. This is quite fundamental, and it's a very easy question to state. I want this level of performance. What is the cheapest network you can build? So we don't have an understanding of this very simple question so far. We'll break it down a little bit. One is, how close can we get to an optimal network topology? Right? All the literature in the past has said things like, topology A is better than topology B by about 10%. There's nothing that tells us how far we are from the finishing line in this race. That is one of the things we'll talk about. And the other is, how do we deal with heterogeneous components? So a bunch of this work, for instance, a hypercube, every node must look the same, right? What happens? How do we build networks when nodes don't look all the same? So that is the problem of heterogeneity in networks. While the past literature does not answer these two questions, it does tell us interesting things. We'll take some credit for that. Uh, this is our past work, Jellyfish, from about two years ago, which proposed using random networks as data center interconnects. Now, Jellyfish had some surprising conclusions, one of which is that it beats fat trees on capacity by about 25%. So it has 25% more throughput than fat trees at the same cost. It is also easier to expand, and this is uh, quantifiable. It's 60% cheaper to expand the network than the heuristic alternative that is available. Now, the lack of structure, Jellyfish is a random network, the lack of structure does impose challenges on routing and cabling, but these are solvable problems, and the results that are included here already account for those minor inefficiencies. However, these results, again, raise the same questions. If you can do 25% better than fat trees, how much further can you really go? Are we 10x behind what could be possible? So Jellyfish does not answer that question, and Jellyfish, again, does not handle heterogeneity. These are the two questions that will be answered. We'll make progress towards answering these in this talk. So before I do that, I'll tell, us, tell you a little bit about the methods we use for measuring throughput. So we are essentially treating network traffic as a fluid here and maximizing the minimum flow. The traffic pattern we are using is random permutation traffic. There are results for some other traffic patterns in the paper but we'll keep things simple here. For the course of this talk, I will only be focusing on results for random permutations. Random permutations mean each server sends and receives traffic from exactly one other server, and this combination is decided randomly. 
In other recent work, which I will shamelessly advertise here, we have explored this problem in more detail as to how you should measure throughput and why what we're doing here is one of the right things to do. Uh, this is joint work with the same group and our bright new grad, Sangeeta, who is also in the audience, and you can ping her for questions later. The full tech report is available in our archive. A couple of the interesting highlights that I'll mention from this work are that one, bisection bandwidth is not the same as throughput. It's not worst case throughput, it's not average case throughput. The two have an uneasy relationship. So stop using bisection bandwidth as a metric for uh, network performance. It's good for certain things, for resilience perhaps, but not for throughput. And we do, in fact, present some near worst case traffic patterns in this work, uh, of which random permutations are one, which is what we are using in the rest of this talk. With that said, we can get back to the question of interest, how close can we get to optimal network capacity? Here I'll present a simple upper bound on the capacity of any network that is built with identical switches and has a fixed constant degree. Right? So every switch just has a fixed number of ports. So the number of flows in your network times the capacity you use per flow has to be less than or equal to the total capacity. No getting around that. And the capacity per flow is simply throughput per flow times the mean path length. So if you have a one gig flow that travels four hops, it uses four gigs of capacity in the network. You can rearrange this to get a bound on throughput. Now the total capacity is simply the sum of the capacities of your links, which is a budgeted constraint. The number of flows is your workload. So these two things you don't have much play in. What you really want to do if you want an upper bound on throughput is to have a lower bound on mean path length. Quite conveniently, this obscure guy who models funny t-shirts on magazine covers by the name of Vint Surf, doesn't ring a bell, did this as far back in 1974. And I'm going to give some brief intuition for his uh, result here. So what you're going to try to do here is to pack in as many nodes as possible at as small distances as possible. So we'll work with an example where the network degree is six. So in one hop, you can reach at most six nodes, right? The network degree is six. In two hops, you can reach this many nodes, and so on. This is optimistic because at some point, you have to stop growing like a tree and collapse edges inwards, right? So this gives us a lower bound on the average shortest path length. And we tr as we showed, we can translate this to an upper bound to an upper bound on throughput. How does the random graph or jellyfish-like networks compare to this uh, upper bound? Right? On the x-axis here, you have the network size. And on the y-axis is throughput, which is normalized now to this upper bound. This is the result for a random graph uh, with five servers per switch and, again, random permutation traffic between the servers. Pretty close and some other traffic patterns which we tested, including all to all. The result is that random graphs are pretty close to optimal, within a few percent of the optimal throughput achievable, and we don't even know whether that bound is achievable or not. Also, this is about bounds. This is about as far as we have gotten with the theoretical analysis. Through experiment, we've also been able to show in more recent work that random graphs beat other topologies significantly. So not only are they closer to the bound, other topologies are further from the bound, further away. So that's round, that rounds up one segment of my talk, which is how close can we get to optimal network capacity? Very close. And random graphs are a good way of getting there. So how do we handle the second piece, which is heterogeneity? With heterogeneity, you don't have a simplistic setting like this. Now, this in itself is not simplest, simplistic. Network design, even for ho homogeneous uh, switches, is pretty complicated. And when you have network elements that are more diverse, for instance, you might have multiple types of switches, some switches have higher port counts than others, things get more complicated. So what we are going to do is leverage the result that we have just established, that random graphs are a pretty good topology for homogeneous design. So what we'll do is we'll sort of group these nodes together into different types. And we'll use, we'll decide on volumes of connectivity that we want to establish between these different clusters, and then use randomness to fill in the gaps. 
So that's the gist of our plan. So throughout this talk, we'll work with only two types of switches. One have lower port count, and the others have higher port count. And we'll have the same homogeneous servers throughout. There are some additional results in the paper, but this is uh, what I'll be presenting here. So to use random graphs as a building block, what we need to do is answer two questions. One is, how should we distribute the servers? Should we have more servers, for instance, connected to the higher port count switches, or vice versa? And how should we interconnect these switches? Should there be a very dense interconnect between the two types of switches, or should that interconnect be thin and you should have uh, dense networks inside those two blobs? Now keep in mind throughout that those are not physical clusters. This is just an abstract view for uh, getting a handle on the problem. So let's examine the first question then, distributing servers. So there are a variety of options here. One, for example, is to connect all the servers to the low degree switches. The other extreme is to connect all the servers to the high degree switches. And then you have a range of options in between. This is exactly what's being varied on the x-axis of this plot. The number of servers at the large switches keeps increasing towards the right. And on the y-axis, you have the throughput. This is what the trend looks like. The optimum point here is when you distribute servers in proportion to the port count of switches. And we've tested this out over tens of different combinations, different levels of oversubscription, different absolute parameters. The result holds. Simple as it is, we do, finding a proof for this is an open problem as yet. Now, the interesting thing here is networks today are not built like this at all. In fact, we do something that's quite the reverse. We put in all the servers at the TARS, place them at one place in the network, and then the high degree switches just form the network and interconnect. So this result suggests that that is the wrong way to do things. On the second question, how do we interconnect switches? Again, there are several options here. For example, you could just connect the two clusters densely inside the cluster, and that would uh, give you a disconnected network, bad for throughput, at least for our minimum flow definition of throughput. Or you could go to the other extreme and have a complete bipartite interconnect. Or you would have several possibilities in between. This is exactly what's being varied on the x-axis in this plot. Uh, and on the y-axis is throughput again. So the number of cross-cluster links increases on the x-axis. What do you expect this to look like? Should it look like the plot we just saw? Or something like this? Or perhaps this? Well, it looks like this. You have a linear growth. And it plateaus after that. Now, again, we have tested this over multiple tens of different uh, combinations, and the result always holds. And the vanilla random interconnect, where you just blindly make all connections randomly, is one of the optimal possibilities. The intuition for this result is as follows. So you have these two clusters and two servers that want to communicate with each other in different clusters. So you have several paths between them, some of which zigzag through the connections across the two clusters, and some of them stay in one cluster longer and jump to the other one, and so on. Now, when you narrow this cut or reduce the number of cross-cluster connections, what happens is some of these paths are no longer available. In spite of the large number of options available for paths, you still need one, at least one crossing. And that's when you lose that fraction of connectivity, for example, if you have average path length four in the network, if one out of every four links does not cross over to the other side, you'll begin losing throughput. So that has to happen. And that is pretty much what we see in the results. So that is the intuition. The proof is in the paper. And we do have some bounds that explain these results very well. Here on this plot, I'm just flashing an upper bound on throughput and the empirical value we see by, via experiment, pretty close together. We do have constant factor matching lower bounds as well in a special case. Now, I'll explore this result a little more because it's quite interesting. I did not personally expect to see this uh, sort of shape in the throughput profile. Uh, and I was quite surprised by it. I don't know if the audience shares my surprise, but I'll have fun with it anyway. So on the left side, the linear growth is explained by the sparsest cut, which is the cut between those two clusters. So when the cut is too small, that's what bottlenecks the throughput. So a very, uh, very small amount of flow can cross that cut, and that's the limiting factor for throughput. On the right-hand side, the capacity in the network is just more or less like a fluid. 
and it depends more on the average path length as to what throughput you get. Now this has interesting implications. Apart from the one that I just talked about, you have a wide range of connectivity options here that's just clear from the plot. So networks that are like this with a large amount of connectivity between the two clusters perform similarly to networks like this with a little lesser connectivity between the clusters, right? And this also gives you some intuition for why bisection bandwidth is not the same thing as throughput, again. Also, this also means that you have greater freedom in cabling. You can localize a lot of cables to a certain region, and you'll still get the same throughput to a certain extent. We'll do a quick recap here. So we saw, we answered this question, how close can we get to optimal network capacity? The answer is very close. How do we distribute servers? Distribute them in proportion to port counts of switches. How should we interconnect switches? Well, there are a variety of options. The vanilla random interconnect is one of them. So just use that. So now we'll use these insights to improve a real world heterogeneous topology, which is the VL2 topology, as Chang, was, uh, uh, Chang just mentioned. Now this was published in 2009 SIGCOM, and the topology is pretty simple uh, hierarchical tree-like structure. On the top, you have high-degree switches, which are the aggregation switches. These have large port counts. And then, sorry, th those are the core switches, which I say aggregation. And then you have in the middle layer aggregation switches, which have lower port counts. And on the bottom, you have TARs, which are top-of-rack switches, which connect directly to servers. Now, in this topology, everything except the TARs has only 10G connectivity, so we cannot really place servers anywhere else. So that's what we'll continue to do. So servers will continue to be connected only to TARs. And uh, what we'll do is we'll connect the TARs, sorry, we'll connect the TARs in proportion to the intermediate and aggregation switch degrees. And then we'll use a uniform random interconnect for the rest of the network. What this does is it gives us a 40% gain in throughput compared to VL2. And we tested this for, so this was for random permutation traffic. We tested this for other traffic patterns as well. This is a very hard traffic pattern to route. It's rack to rack. So each rack just sends all its traffic to some randomly chosen other rack. So the reason this is hard is because you basically have a limited cone of paths between those two racks, and all the flows are trying to use just that connectivity. And all to all is a little bit easier. So I hope we've convinced you that we've made some reasonable progress on this big question, and uh, you will refer to our paper for more results. We have results on uh, line speed, heterogeneity, and such. Uh, things do get a little more tricky there. Our source code is available on this URL, and you can test any variety of topologies. We have quite a bunch already in there, and uh, you can add topologies, add workloads, and we'll be happy to publish your results on our website or something, whatever you like. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Tom Anderson, UW. Um, do you have any evidence that your workload ha represents anything that anybody actually runs? So this is the, there's a very good reason that we use this workload. Using specific workloads, for example, you could get maybe some data from Microsoft and use it in one test, right? But that is not going to, you can make the claim that that's not representative of all data centers. What we, why we are using this workload is because it's, within 2x of what's the worst case traffic pattern. I'll state this hopefully better now. Uh, if you can achieve throughput t with an all-to-all -all traffic workload, then you can achieve throughput t by 2 for any workload. So it makes sense to use this workload. So we have a proof of this fact in our other paper. That is why we are using these workloads. These are hard workloads, and we provide uh, harder workloads than all-to-all -all in our work. Uh, so the point is, is that you have uh, just to kind of restate what you said. To the reason that you're picking this workload, and 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 any claim that you would have about optimality is only for this workload. I'll temper that a little bit. It's only for any any sort of workload that's uniform in some way. Well, in, in particular, you've claimed that it's it's really important to be using these approaches because they're much better than in the existing known results yes. that we have for bisection bandwidth yes. because you think, uh, the only reason for why you might think that is that you think that the workloads that we would be running would be ones that, that stress the difference between 
your workload and by and a, and a workload that would stress by by section bandwidth. And so what I was trying to get at is why you think there really is a significant difference between those two. That, that we really should be optimizing our networks for the type of thing that you're that you would at, like advoc advocate optimizing the network for versus optimizing the network for something else. Uh, and the and the reason I'm asking this question is I really want to avoid a stream of papers where we start to optimize work uh, topologies for made up workloads. I think that's that's a that's a dangerous thing for us to go down. That is a great towards. point. Yes, this is why we need something of the sort that we are trying to do in the other paper, which says that this is like worst case traffic pattern. So if you build this network, you'll be good. You are absolutely correct in saying that if you had a specific application, for example, if you wanted to model the atmosphere or you want to do physical modeling, then by all means, go build a torus. Nothing will beat it. So for specific applications, if you do know the workload, build a topology specific to it. But if you want to build a generic high capacity interconnect that tackles a wide variety of applications, build this and you will have better guarantees than anything else that's available. We are arguing, we have written up an entire paper on this, we are arguing that these are the right workloads to use and we have good reasons because these are like worst case uh, workloads. There's no other workload out there that can make that claim. There's, there's literally nothing else. If you can point to something, we'll be happy to use that instead. Kostin, I'll let you pull in your Actually following up, um, so I, I, I think I agree with your point about this is the worst case traffic metrics or close to it. What I don't agree is uh, what percentage of servers are actually doing the traffic matrix at this point, right? So you're right, assuming right. 100%, right? Uh, and you're sort of designing for the worst case, not only traffic matrix, but load. Yes. Which, which is a different yes. thing. Uh, so I would sort of, you know, out of the air, I'd say it's like 30% utilization on average, okay? So in that case, you'd have a 30% uh, you know, one one of three servers using this traffic matrix. You know, still permutation, uh, but then when you optimize, I mean, it's like in computer science we optimize for the average case, not the worst case. So I understand why you want to provision for the worst case, but you should optimize for the average case, and that's why I sort of agree with Tom that optimizing for the absolute worst case seems like it's you know. So here's what you could do: if you want to operate at a lower load factor, this will still be optimal. The load factor is not. At uh, in a matter of discussion here, the I, skew I, I is. I would argue now, the that skew is. I agree with you. I, I would argue that if you know you're operating at a lower load factor, you should put more links in your from your servers to your tors, sure. so that sure. you know the, the 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 host can burst at higher speeds, right? So it's 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 actually not the same, right? I mean, what what you say is like one link from the host to the tor, which is different, right? What I'm claiming is that you can build a thinner random network. You can use uh, switches with high, uh, lower degree, for example and you'll get the same benefits. The difference, though, is in the skew of traffic. For example, if you have skewed traffic, then what you should be doing, for example, is something like the hybrid approach, right? The, the very interesting point here is if you have data skew, you're saying that mostly you're operating at this 30% level, but some servers operate at this 100% level. The point is you don't know in advance which servers are sure. going to do that, sure. which is why you need high capacity, or you need something that handles that high traffic workload separately. So either you use this random interconnect, build at a 30% level throughout, and use some optical connectivity on the side to tackle the peaks, or build it all at a high Thanks. load factor. So let's just take it one more second. So okay. uh, hey, uh, Vyash from CMU. So I'm not going to give you any pain about your workload. Uh, I actually have a question <laughs> Thank about you. the first, first part of your talk. Uh, so you're talking about these random graphs and uh, so lo shortest paths, but it seems like it's sort of very sensitive to the fact that you're using shortest paths. But we know from like traffic engineering world that shortest paths may not necessarily optimize like sort of congestion and so on. And yes. in fact, VLB does not do shortest path, right? It does like yes. this two 2x stretch. Yes. And uh, how sensitive is that result in the first half to the shortest path assumption? So uh, that result entire, entirely depends on shortest paths. The flows have to take average shortest path lengths. Uh, so if I did traffic engineered routes, would that, would that result still hold? So what we are doing instead is we are showing that in under real, so I did not show the result here, but under real uh, sort of uh, routing, we have multipath TCP based, you select a set of short paths, not necessarily shortest paths always, just some X number of those shortest paths between two destinations and use those with multipath TCP and you get pretty close to what we predict here with the, just a flow model. Okay. So packet level results match the flow model results 
within a few percent, like three or four percent, that's uh, in the paper, there's an experiment. All right, thanks. So I forgot to introduce Ankit at the beginning of this talk. So he is a UIUC student in Trident Baptist School, and he's one year away from graduation. So let's thank him again.